So Joshua is sending two spies into the promised land to check out the wall of Jericho. Now, in the book of Numbers, Joshua was one of the 12 spies that Moses sent into the promised land to check out the land. In Joshua, he sends in two spies to check out the wall of Jericho. They got into the wall of Jericho. They went into someone's house. You know this already. What's her name? Rahab. Rahab happens to be a prostitute. Now, she lives between the walls of Jericho because every visitor that came into the land would have to go there if they want a place to stay that and some fun. Let's just say for what it is. She is a prostitute. So the two spies went and hid in her house. Now, somehow the king of Jericho found out that they have some spies coming in. So he sends out some soldiers to look for the spies. They went straight to Rahab's house. Now, I don't know how they knew or what's going to happen. The reason I think it's because her home or her practice was right at the entrance of the city. So that was the first place to go. Now, they went and hid in her house. The soldiers showed up. Hey, where's the spies? We heard about them. Did you hide them? Did you see them? She said, "Um, no. Yes, they were here. But they left before it got dark, before the city gate was closed, so I sent them off already. But if you hurry up, you can probably catch up to them. So the soldiers believed her and ran off. Now, what she did was she took the two spies and hid them on the roof of her house. After the soldiers left, she went on the roof, and she consulted with them, which you heard already. She says, because of we heard about your God, we heard what he did on east of the Jordan. He, we heard what he did to the kings there, and we are in tremble. We are in fear that you are going to wipe us out because we know your God is the God of the heaven and the God of the earth. But please, I'm risking my life to save you. When you come back to take over this land, save my family. And they agree. They made a deal. Show us where to go. When we come to your city, tie a cord, a scarlet cord, on your window, and we will know to not invade your home. And we will save everyone that's in it, your family members, your fathers, your cousins. And surely it happened. Now, I feel like we went through this already right before Christmas. Remember the story of Rahab, the ladies, the women that brought us Jesus? There are two sermons here. And I want to let you choose. Can you hire the lights a little bit? It's a little dim out there. I want to see the beautiful faces in here this morning. Even higher. I want to see it. And so that you don't fall asleep. And I want to welcome those who are watching online. There are two sermons in here, okay? I want to let you choose which one you want to hear. The first one is... God can use whoever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. He can use a prostitute to save the nation of Israel invading Jericho. And I can tell you that your past doesn't define you, that God looked past your sins and he can use you. And you're going to walk out of here feeling great because you're saying to yourself, if God can use a prostitute, he can use me too. That's one sermon. The other sermon, I can challenge your intellectual level. Why do you believe what you believe? Why are you sitting in here today worshiping Jesus? The cro- what does the cross mean? I can challenge your intellectual level by showing you the complexity of God's salvation plan for humanity. Why does Christianity continue to be the biggest religion in the world? And the three major religions in the world ties to Judaism the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I can preach the first sermon or the second one, challenge your intellectual level of this is God's work and his plan in this story of Rahab. Which one do you want to hear? The first one or the second one? The second one. The second one? All right. Need to change the slides. We're going to go with the second one. 
All right, here we go. We're going with the second one. You choose it, okay? So let's rock and roll. So getting ready to go into the promised land, Joshua is not an irres- irresponsible man. He's, he's a do. He, he, he's a, a commander. He leads an army. He's doing all his due diligence. So before he enters into the promised land, he sends two spies to check out the walls of Jericho. In order to understand what's happening here in the book of Rahab, we have to understand the sacrificial system and the burnt offering that God has set up, his salvation plans for humanity, the Judaism, the root of Christianity. So we're going to start really quick, and we're going to go right through it. So after the creation of the world, the world was just spinning out of control. People were doing whatever they want, however they want. They show no regards, no respect to God whatsoever. But in the Jewish mind, they knew that something is going to happen. The Messiah is going to come. Somehow God has a plan to save the world from his sins. And you might know this already in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Even the angels were wondering how is God going to do this. This is what it says. The Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. The same way you and I are wondering how the world is going to end and how Jesus is going to come back and how God's going to save the world. Well, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, they were thinking about the same thing. When is the Messiah going to come? How is God going to redeem everything? So it begins with this God's salvation plan. Let's pretend you're sitting in the Bible college class. The word is type of. The Old Testament word to represent Jesus is Christology or type of. This is a type of, a picture of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 22, God called Abraham after a promise that you're going to be the father of nations. Your your descendant's going to be like the sand of the seashore. But he asked Abraham to do one thing. To do what? To sacrifice his only son. Genesis chapter 22, verse 3. Early in the morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When they had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place of God and had told about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw a place in the distance. So God, essentially, God asked Abraham to, to sacrifice your son. And he set out, and on the third day, remember these things in mind, on the third day, God provided the sacrifice. So Abraham didn't have to. The first type of, the first picture you see, it's God is setting up for something. A picture of a sacrifice, a picture of three days, a picture of a donkey, a picture of God is going to provide, that God's plan to save the world, it's a work of God, it has nothing to do with with us. After Abraham's, more sin happened. People just did whatever they wanted. They disregard God. They built armies. They enslaved people. A, a father slips with their own children, and, and the people betray people, and, and of brothers betrayed and sold their brothers into slavery, so they end up in Egypt, where you get the story, the prince of, jo- the prince of Egypt, the story of Moses, the story of Joseph, and in Egypt, Joseph was so uh, uh, good at what he does with his dreams, so, so Pharaoh promoted him to a higher position. And the famine hit the land. And in desperate of supplies and resources, Joseph's father and his 11 brothers went over into Egypt to beg for food, and it happens to be his own son. And after a time goes by and the Egyptians begin to enslave the Israelites again, and God called Moses, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to do what? Say what, Larry? A little louder, Larry. Let my people go. And then Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston came out in their dresses and said, do, do you believe? Okay, Prince of Egypt, come on, guys. You know the story, okay? Just kidding, they didn't do that that time. 
but that's what happened. And then, in order for them to leave Egypt, as inconvenient as this is, the plague happened. But one of the plague, it has to do with the firstborn son, the son of Pharaoh, the firstborn, and all their firstborn in Egypt has to what? Die. But the Israelites would take a blood of a goat and would kill the goat and put it on the doorpost. And when the spirit passes through at night, when they recognize the blood on the doorpost, their children will be saved. You can find this in Exodus chapter 12. Then tell them it's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passes over to the house of the Israelites, Egypt, and spare our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Sacrifice. God provided. In order to save the sins of the world, something has to replace the sins of the world. Something has to take place. A sacrifice has to be made. The big word that we use is propitiation, in place of. So after they left Egypt, they ran. They ran for roughly 70 miles, a trip that took about three days to the edge of the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 13, verse 20. After leaving Sarkat, they camp out at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of night left them from their place in front of the people. A trip that took three days where God provided a way and they cross the Red Sea. So in order to redeem the sins of the world, to save the world, a sacrifice has to be made. Something has to happen, a replacement, God's plan of salvation. And after they exited from Egypt, God commanded this. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, When anyone sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, if the anointed priest sin, bring guilt on the people, he must bring to the Lord a young bull without defects as sin offering to the sin he has committed. He is to present the bull at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. He is to lay his hand on the, his head and slaughter it there before the lid. Let me tune in for you. Are you watching this at home? Lean in. Why do you believe what you believe? Why is Jesus? Why the Old Testament? Why Judaism? Why do you come to term? I'm saved. What does that mean? What does it mean for me to be saved? What does it mean for God to redeem the sins of the world? For the Jewish people, they literally believe that once a year, they take a goat at the entrance of their camp, and the high priest would put his hand on the goat, and he would slit the throat of the goat. The blood would pour out. It represents covering. They actually believe that the sins of the people would go through the priest into the goat. The blood of the goat would wash away their sins. And you read that a little further. They actually have two goats, and they let one goat go. It's called the scapegoat. And that goat ran into the wilderness to take the sins of the people as far as east or west as possible. This is the salvation plan, the system, the sacrificial system that God had set up to redeem us of our sins. To understand the story of Rahab, you needed to understand that, what God has set up. It's a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. So here we are, Joshua chapter 2 before they enter into the promised land, God gave them a type of, a picture of sacrificial system in the story of Rahab. Here we go. Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of us, of you, has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting because of you, are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord drive up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Shechem and Og, the two kings of Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you destroyed completely. When we heard it, our hearts melt in fear and everyone's courage fail because of you. The Lord your God is the God of heaven above and the earth below. This is real fear. She's afraid. She's not part of, of God's people. The land she grew up in represents 
the rebellions of the people since the creation of the world, Rahab knew that God is the real deal and judgment day is coming. She knows the land that she was living in is going to be wiped out. Now, all of children are God's children. But think a little deeper. The spiritual here. The land is about to be wiped out. She's confessing that I need your God. Nothing within these walls of Jericho is going to save me. I need your God. I'm not good enough. There's nothing I have done. There's nothing I'm going to do to be saved. Salvation begins with a heart, a confession. Salvation begins with the heart of confession. Rahab begs for mercy, asks for help. We know our days are coming. We know you're coming. We know your God is coming. We are melting. This is a confession from Rahab. And just like you and I, we're going to have to come to a point in our lives where do we admit that this is a God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. Not any gods, not, not the yoga God, not the gods that you might have your friends thinking, sitting around with burning incense and say this. No, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At some point, you're going to have to confess that. But this is the type of the picture I want you to get. Okay, in verse 6, but she had taken them up on the roof and hitting them under the stalks of flax she had laid out before the roof. This is the picture. Can you pull that up? So the way they dry these, these grass is they create two layers, one on the bottom and a little bit in between and on top. So in order for them, her to hide these slaves, she has to put them or the spies between the grass, the, the flax. So there's a layer at the bottom. They go in between and she put on top of it. It's a picture of an animal being sacrificed. It's a picture of a burnt offering. It's a picture of replacing. A picture of this offering here. That's, there's people in there and this altar. It's a burnt offering. They sacrifice. And then, verse 16, after the guards left, she said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return. Then go on your way. The hills, from the walls of Jericho to the hills, pull that picture Roughly two and a half to three miles. That's the wall, the remaining of the wall of Jericho. You see the front of the screen. And the hill is just right there. Roughly about three miles hike. And when they get there, they have to go into a cave and hide. It's the type of a picture of a burial. Salvation requires a new life. Three days later, God provided a sacrifice for Abraham. Three days later, they got into the Red Sea to be free. Three days later, they have to hide from the guards in order to set free. The picture of a burial of a new life is about to happen. And this is the agreement they came up with. Verse 17, now the men have said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be blind on us, binding on us, unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and your family into the house. So this is the agreement. This is when you let us down, use the same cord, a scarlet cord, hang that out your window. This is what it looks like. So when we come and take the city, that is a sign of your house. And we're not going to invade it. God provided a sacrifice for Abraham, the blood poor. The plague of the firstborn son, the blood poor. And the blood, the color red, smear on their doorposts. The instruction of a burnt offering or sin offering that the priest has to take this animal and put it on the altar and slit the, the blood Poor. In order to save the world, the plan of salvation from God is a sacrifice. 
It's a replacement. Something has to replace our sins. Something has to take on the punishment of our sins. This is the work of God. It's a type of, it's a picture of Jesus in the story of Rahab. It gets even better. Six chapter later, it's going to break your heart. Joshua chapter 6. It's going to break your heart. When the trumpets sound, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword everything living in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys, Six chapters later, the nation of Israel invaded Jericho and killed everybody. Men, women, children, any living thing that was living in the walls of Jericho was destroyed. And when you read that as a non-Christian or or, or someone who just came to the faith without understanding the stories of God, that is disheartening. That is heartbreaking. And I get it. I've been there. How can a loving, good God do such a thing? Women, children, every living thing? How can a good God do such a thing in this city? And if you are a true believer of Christianity, I don't want you to misunderstand, to overlook this, because it's true. They wipe out everybody. Verse 22, Joshua said to the two men who had spies out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done, spy, who done the spying went into and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Rahab ended up marrying an Israelite who became the mother of Boaz, who ended up marrying Ruth, and you came up with the verses, your God will be my God, your people will be my people, where you go, I will go, where you lay, I will lay. So Rahab became, in the genealogy of Jesus, she was one of the mothers that came down the genealogy that gave birth to Jesus, just so you know God's redemption plan. But this is ugly. It's ugly. An army went into the land. These people were probably peacefully living. They probably didn't know they were sinners. huh? Maybe, I don't know. They have families, they have farms, they have children, they have wives, husbands, and grandparents. They're probably just there living life. And an army of God went in and wiped them out. That should bother you a little bit. But on a spiritual level, God's sacrificial plan, God's salvation plan to save the world, he has to illustrate how ugly sin is. Judgment day is going to come. And when that judgment day comes, it's going to look just like that, that those who are outside of Christ will be judged. I don't know what that will look like, but I do know this. The sin is ugly, that God hates sin. The way he set up for us to be saved is through confession. He made the sacrifice for us, and he was buried for three days, and he resurrected the entire Bible. It's the work of God. So when you look at Jesus on the cross, this aha moment, now that makes sense sense. Now we understand why Jesus has to be sacrificed on the cross because God provided a way. Now you can say this, right? If if, if it's a loving God, why would he do such a thing? Right? In Joshua chapter 2, all the way to chapter, he's a loving God. He's a caring God. Why would he do such a thing? Killing women and children and, and everybody, father, everybody in that land that was not in Rahab's family. And I would say this. It's the same loving God 
that provided a way. So when judgment day comes, you don't have to end up like that desolate land outside of Rahab's family. It's God's salvation plan. It's a picture, a type of Jesus in the Old Testament so we understand the sacrifice. And then Jesus comes along. For three years, he taught and taught and taught. For three years, he showed them a picture of of what God is, who God is. For three years, he gave them an idea of what's going to happen to him. For three years, he taught how the, the sins, Genesis, all the way to leading up to him, that he is the sacrifice that God provided. In John chapter 12, verse 27 to 50, it says this. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then the voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said, a thunderous other says angel has spoken to him. This is a public place. He's in the middle of teaching. A voice from heaven says to him, I will glorify you. This is the Messiah. And everyone heard it. Jesus, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on the world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He says this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told him, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. Before darkness overtakes you, whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. The story of Rahab is a type of Jesus showing us a spiritual picture that you confess your sins, that you believe that Jesus is the sacrifice, that he is your Lord, that he's your Savior. The burial Jesus represented through baptism is the perfect picture of a new life. So on that judgment day, it's going to come. And on that day, it's not, oh, God, you're such a mean God. No, you don't have the room or time to say that when that day comes. And he was resurrected three days later, where you go into the water, you come out. The newness of life is a resurrection, is a picture, a type of. Rahab is a perfect picture of us, you and I. Rahab is a perfect picture of our sins that can be forgiven. Rahab is a perfect picture of confession, of hiding the spies, of hanging on the red cord so we can be saved. The red cord that she hung, it's the, it's the blood, the covering. It's her faith meets the work of God. There's nothing we can do to be safe. And then Jesus comes along and he says, the Son of Man will be lifted up. And whoever believes in the Son of Man will be safe. And now in the 21st century, you're sitting here in America We wonder, why do we believe what we believe? Why do we go to this thing? Why do we read the Bible? Why do we pray? Because since the creation of the world, when we look at that, it makes perfect sense of the sacrifice, the propitiation. In order for us to be saved, someone, something has to die in our place. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you so much for all that you've given us.
We thank you for the story of Rahab. And so often we miss the point. And yes, you can use us, whoever, however, whenever. But the richest in your word, the type of Jesus in the Old Testament, help us to put our faith in you because it just makes sense. God, we thank you for providing the perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.